Hello, everybody. Uh, welcome to the Grass Special Seminar. Uh, today, I'm very glad to introduce to you Professor Yezu Yang. He's directing the Arizona State uh, Active Perception Group. Uh, Yezu, you are talking to the birthplace of active perception. And, uh, and in the, you know, in 1979, when the Grass Club was founded, the A in the Grass Club was uh, active then a robotic active sensory perception. This was uh, probably the first lab uh, called active perception. Uh, so uh, Yezu Yang uh, did uh, his undergraduate at uh, Zhejiang uh, University. Uh, I have been really blessed with postdocs and students from Zhejiang. We have a uh, first two year students, first two, two first year students right now who are whose visa is pending, unfortunately, uh, and uh, from Zhejiang. And then he did his PhD at the University of Maryland, College Park. Uh, he joined Arizona State uh, and uh, he received the NSF uh, Career Award in uh, 2018. And uh, he has uh, uh, also uh, quite strong uh, industrial uh, funding from Qualcomm and uh, Amazon. And uh, he will uh, talk uh, today about uh, visual recognition beyond appearances and with applications uh, in uh, robotics. Uh, Yezu, go ahead. Uh. Thank you. Thank you, Costas. Um, I'm super um, flat. Um, I'm glad that I got this opportunity to talk to you. Grasp Lab, as Costas mentioned, is the the history and the origin of GRASP lab relates fairly closely with active perception. I hope my efforts, especially my recent effort at ASU, trying to extend the concept of active perception in Arizona State could also get your comments and as well as suggestions from GRASP lab. Today, I would like to talk about visual recognition beyond appearances and its robotic application. Before I start, I would like to talk a little bit about myself since um, Costas already laid out the journey that uh, have me traveled here. So I started at Zhejiang University I doing computer vision at that time. I joined ASU uh, a UMD Perception and Robotics Group with Yanis Alimonos, um, Manipulation, Action, Understanding and Execution on Humanoid Robots. Then I joined ASU, started ASU APG, the foundation that we are attending to are still visual recognition is starting from the very early days, but the applications that we're attending to are intelligent agents, um, a movable agents. More recently, since the involvement with Arizona's Institute of Automated Mobility, we're also doing research in mobile, uh, especially autonomous driving stuff as well. We do recognize there is a gap, and this is the gap that we argue is the capability to do visual recognition beyond appearances. Today's talk, I'm going to mainly focus on the um, uh, yellow area here, um, uh, sharing some of our group's recent work um, in this area and also moving towards the robotic application we would like to talk about robotic object search. As it being said, since it's a virtual talk, um, feel free to post your questions in the chat box. I will monitor it uh, uh, here and there. And also please feel free to unmute yourself if you want to stop me and ask questions. I prepared a 40 minutes talk, but the talk can, end, uh, um, can be extended and the later part can be skipped to make sure um, we made on time. With that being said, you may wonder, what is visual recognition beyond appearances? What do you mean by that? It's all the way traced back to the uh, uh, novel that I read, and it's my favorite, one of my favorite novelists, Italo Calvino, in his book, Invisible Cities, describes such a city called Despina. And this imagined city is landing between the ocean and desert. Then you have people traveling in the desert for months, see the exact same city as if they are vessels. And you have people sailing in the ocean for months, see exactly the same city and discern uh, a, a camel. So what it's basically saying is the same appearances, 
when you get into the human cognitive process, you may yield totally different concepts. This is what we call it visual recognition beyond appearances. Of course, it is in the literature space. We don't actually need to go that far in the classic history of computer vision. By the way, my uh, academic training is in computer vision and I also teaching perception in robotics at ASU. If you go back and look at all the classic um, problems such as stereo matching, optical flow estimation, SLAM, what we are seeing is there are clear, well-defined mathematical constraints such as epipolar constraint, brightness consistent constraint for optical flow, as well as for SLAM, it is the loop closure constraint. They are well-defined physical constraints. We can model them in the model training and learning fairly well in literature. While we're delving into the cognitive vision period, um, uh, um, uh, era starting from 2000 or 2010, the constraint becomes a bit more blurred. What do I mean by blurred? I'll give you guys some examples. If you are looking at this image, and if we follow the definition of image captioning on task and ask the audience to describe what you see, you may see, okay, I might discern a duck, or it also looks like a rabbit. But if I put the context in, immediately you can you'll, you'll realize it's the duck and it's about to eat a piece of bread. But if I switch the context, the same um, texture will yield a totally different semantic label as rapid. Now here, we are basically saying context matter, uh, but how to mathematically model it, how to distill that into the model training. That's the problem we are facing. It actually extends to visual linguistic QA as well. If I give you this image, ask um, the audience, what do you see? You may well um, uh, with high confidence saying it's a high-end lens. But if I pair it with the actual text that I got the image from, now you realize that it's actually a cheap low-end travel mug, but in the shape of lens. Here we are indicating the linguistic context also matters in our active way to uh, perceiving objects, how to model it. Most recently, more recently, I gave a talk at New Rips while living in um, uh, Montreal, I took this image. Now, I wouldn't be surprised that the state of the art vision system will be able to recognize one person, second person, and third person. But in order to answer high level cognitive questions such as how many people are waiting for bus, is it two or three, you really need to figure out whether the third person is a statue or a performance artist. Of course, here we need to relate to the external knowledge or common sense knowledge or the knowledge you got from your previous experience. Um, if you were a McGill University student, you understand that this state statue is essentially built to commemorating Steve, the passing of Steve Jobs. That gives you confidence to answer that there are actually only two living person waiting for the bus. The point here is all those semantic constraints that we can describe using natural language, using intuitions, uh, using inspirations, how to model them into model learning. Um, and all through today's talk, I would like to give the audience some of the early work and recent work that we are working on, try to um, pave into this avenue. Now, the root of this problem essentially always comes back to the definition of visual recognition. The widely accepted uh, um, 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 paradigm of visual recognition in the community is treating it as a pattern matching, right? It's a process that involves identification of a visible category from previous encounters. But the actual definition of visual recognition is not just about identifying a, count, a category, but as a, actually a visible concept. Whenever it involves concept, then it always involves the, the theory of concept. It's about the kind of knowledge stored in concept, the way they are used in agents' cognitive processes, their format, their acquisitions as well. And notice, it is not only just from previous encounters, AKA the training data, but also from the knowledge. And this knowledge part is all uh, is kind of like uh, um, not well modeled in visual recognition literature, uh, especially uh, in the recent years. 
this is not my idea, actually. It's also um, partially from this book um, from uh, Edward Maltry in Canada. And all over the book, his arguing categories are not concepts, thus pattern matching are not visual recognition. Now, all these ideas are great, um, uh, um, elegant, I would argue, but before we move on, we need benchmarking tasks to validate our ideas to show how we can distill semantic concepts or semantic constraints into model training. Luckily, the community is diligently compiling challenging cognitive um, vision tasks, such as image captioning from Flickr 8K to MS Coco and go on, and a, a natural extension is video captioning, getting a video in, you want the system to caption and describe what you see, as always, a step further, you'll involve QA, and here is VQA, VQA CP, all the derivatives from David Parikh and other research groups. Basically, the, uh, um, the task here is you are given an image and a natural language question, you want the system to answer with one single concept using natural language. Um, and more recently, people delve into in, uh, modeling action into the uh, system as well. Then it leads to the visual navigation without ex explicit mapping uh, functions. Uh, we have house 3D, AI to song, room to room, all those challenges coming out. So over the talk, we are also going to um, uh, um, rely on those benchmark tests um, uh, and challenges to show our ideas. All the journey actually starts tracing back to 2011. We were among the first to propose that you can do recognition in the visual space and then model the uh, uh, word knowledge in the language space using a simply large scale corpus parsing and get the contextual information. And this linguistic contextual information essentially already helping me or helping the system to generate uh, reasonable captions at that time, even though fairly rudimentary. After I joined ASU, we start to think, what can we do, right? It's in the um, 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 fall 2016. At that time, together with ASU um, um, knowledge reasoning professor, Chita Barrao, we start to involve and explore whether we can um, uh, um, uh, attach external knowledge pieces into what can be recognized from the image space. At that time, we call it scene description graph, what was introduced in uh, CBIU 2017. What we are showing here is if we use this external knowledge using this explicit knowledge representations, when the training data is small, our model can achieve better caption um, performance as well as uh, image retrieval performance um, due to the explicit knowledge pieces guiding us uh, to uh, extend understanding of the images. However, we're also observing um, uh, challenges when the training data is getting larger, the end-to-end -end models are almost always outcompete the explicit knowledge-based models in a sense that the explicit knowledge will bring in noises. I will talk about the downside of that as well uh, in, in a minute. Now to continue, we do see some of the success we get using explicit knowledge rep uh, uh, representations. One of it is as um, presented in AAAI 2018, we found it's fairly compatible with expli explicit reasoning engines such as PSL. And we can do that over multiple knowledge resources. Here we're showing a VQA task and we are getting the recognition using visual relationship detection VQA priors, as well as um, visual relations uh, uh, recognitions and utilize the phrasal knowledge uh, uh, mined from the external resources and pipeline them into a PSL engine, we can re-rank the answers. And also while we're picking into the system, we'll be able to also uh, 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 highlight the evidences and those evidences are pr providing certain kind of explainability to the end users um, taking the um, example here, which item on the plate resembles a tree. Um, the VQA prior are saying it's rice, but using our model, we'll be able to say, okay, the correct answer should be broccoli. And why is broccoli? Because the similarity between broccoli and tree is larger than the similarity between rice and tree. So these are the good parts we observe, but the downside on the limitations are also obvious. At around 2018, we are hitting this glass roof 
And by hitting this grass rule, we start to an analyze what are we actually observing. First of all, with the soft reasoning engines, the, linger, the lingering inconsistency among multiple knowledge resources will still hurt the ov overall performance. Also, there is a uh, requirement for the visual recognizers with high fidelity, which, which means if we are dealing with noisy inputs from the visual pathway, the robustness of the system will deter real rate quickly. And also, um, it's worth to mention, uh, it's fairly computationally expensive to do explicit knowledge-based reasoning, if even with uh, accelerated PSL engine, which we developed and uh, which we aug augmented from the original PSL engine, it's still much slower than end-to-end -end approach. And we actually profiled the performance on the typical v the, the classic VQA benchmark. We are showing that if the problem is quite specific, external knowledge may help to certain fairly uh, um, uh, um, um, a small amount of um, improvement. But if the question becomes general, the end-to-end -end models kind of always outperform ours. So that's the challenge we, we are facing at the beginning of 2018. And we're asking ourselves, what's next? Um, Expressing knowledge recognition. Yes, yes, excuse me. I mean, in this table, all the differences are really minimal. I mean, what means worse and uh, better? I mean, in, on the top part, if you go back, mm -hmm. on the top part, uh, uh, your PSL DVQ is slightly better than the quad tension. Uh, or it's around the same. And if you go down general, it's also like 39, 39, 51, 52. I don't see a single one, which is any significant difference. Um, that's a great question, Costas. And that's also indicating the challenge we are having that um, uh, together with the external knowledge, while um, we can add on another layer of explainability, uh, performance wise, we don't see a significant difference and that does not warrant a good um, base for arguing. That's why we want to move on to see if there's any other uh, avenues we should look into the end-to-end -end learning systems and improve from there. So this is the, the, exactly the message. They are not too much difference that leads to our next efforts within the last two or three years. So, so, so you are exactly right. So either the performance comparison is not um, uh, obviously different. And that leads us to our next kind of efforts ongoing. So I will try to address your uh, uh, question in, in, in the later part of the talk as well. Sounds good. All right. Um, so explicit knowledge representation has limitations. So what's next? That's the time around mid of 2018, we start to play with the state of the art systems to do VQA. And if I give you this image and I ask the system, is the plate grain? The answer is kind of fairly confident. Yes. Now you may wonder, there might be some kind of intelligence already exists in the model. However, at that time, we start to play with I mean, very rudimentary logic operations of human beings. At the three years old, can understand if is the plate grain should be yes, then is the plate not grain should be no. However, it seems end-to-end -end models struggle to deal with those logical operations. And you may have a um, uh, feeling that there must be something we should investigate. This is not only applying to negation, but also conjunction and disjunction. And we are proposing in late 2018 using explicit knowledge distillation, which is similar to the explicit knowledge that we are modeling, but we want to distill it into the model learning that to improve VQA model robustness. So here is the example of negation. And we are also can give, um, give some example in composition as well. If the two questions is there beer with respect to this image is yes, is the man wearing shoes is no, then if we logically compose them, is there beer and is the man not wearing shoes, the correct answer should be yes. However, VQA models typically tends to struggle with those combinations as well. 
Now, with these observations, the next steps to, 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 to continue becomes quite straightforward. We start with creating and augmenting the training data, which using template-based procedure following the logical operations, such as negation, composition, um, uh, conjunction, and disjunction. And here is some examples for uh, negating the question using semantic parsing tools from NLP. And also we extend it to create 10 propositional formulae to generate logically composed questions and their ground truth answers. So at this stage, we are essentially utilizing NLP tools to extend and to enlarge the training data to include um, those com logically composed examples. We are not, we didn't stop here. Uh, from the observation of VQA, we also take the advantage that most of the images are coming from MS Coco data set that we can essentially come up with adversarial questions about objects by replacing an object word with an adversarial object word, such as if bottle is existing in the image, then one glass, the adversarial antonyms shouldn't be there. This kind of insight top-down semantic understanding helps us to even extend the training data. And here we call it VQA supplement. But at this point, you may wonder, we are just doing data re-engineering. What's new that you are bringing into the model? We would like to argue that we are, with this guided data re-engineering, we can introduce the semantic constraints or regularizations just like the, semantic, the physical constraints and regularizations in classic vision problems to leverage the pair of data and this pair of data is generated through guided process. In this specific paper, VQA LOL, Lens of Logic, we utilize the Fertret inequality loss, which was introduced in tracing back to 1935, basically saying the likelihood of the events with logical compositions is bounded by their likelihood of each respectively. So with this Fertret compatibility loss, we can essentially delve into the original model training, getting the cross model feature encoder question type question attention, logical attention, and apply the loss in the answering module and help further regularize the model training. With that regularization, we do observe in this figure here, on the original VQA model, our model and SOTA model are having you know, relatively close performance. But if you um, test the SOTA model on um, VQA Compose, which is logically compositions, and VQA supplement, which is further supplemented with uh, human um, uh, MS Coco annotations, SOTA model suffers a lot, while our model still maintain a good uh, um, 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 performance. Um, there is a whole set of ablation studies and experiments being done um, in the original paper, what I um, essentially uh, refer the audiences to, 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 to check if you are interested. But the message here is our model with um, a trained parser, basically an end to end trained uh, uh, system, we can maintain uh, uh, performance on VQA Compose, VQA Supplement, as well as maintain the com um, performance on the uh, original test um, um, data. So, 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 so at this yes, point, yes, you, uh, sorry for interrupting. We, we need some sure. a little clarification uh, how the your approach, the non end, not end to end, pretty much all of us know what it means. But uh, how does your work? You're detecting with a network like the bounding boxes around the objects, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, then uh, are you having a graph out of them or? What do you exactly do? Oh, so essentially, um, that's a good question. So essentially, we are not um, doing the explicit recognition in this specific world. So we adopt the backbone models, such as LXMERT and UpDown models, but we add on the additional semantic constraint, basically saying that if you are able to answer the questions in this um, uh, space, then there, the answers need to be logically consistent. And this consistency is guided by the loss design. 
And um, it is, um, uh, I, mean, I would like to admit that at this stage, we see a bit of success on VQA using the semantic constraint distillation, but now uh, we are also um, uh, more interested to see whether we can extend from simple logical connections. Um, this is actually always all the way tracing back to the CCV 2020. Uh, we are moving on, which we are going to show you what we are doing um, 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 by extending it right now. And just another question. Uh... The, here uh, you are uh, modeling uh, also like things like wearing or like the verb wearing does it play a role or is it just man and shoes just the, the, the context um so costas it seems um the the, the question is, is is broken um oh through. sorry sorry uh the uh do you also recognize like uh, actions like wearing? Oh, not, not actions like. Uh, I see, I see. Verbs. Uh, right. Again, um, we were not following uh, explicit action recognition module to do the reasoning. Uh, however, um, um, and, and I, I would like to argue that action in the language and vision space, especially in the static image space, is mainly um, modeled through the language domain because um, action makes more sense with the video data, which we are going to show you some of our work along that line as well. Yeah, here, here it's not action, it's just the verb, the, wear, the wearing, which is static. Uh -huh. and so are you... Is it really does it matter here, or is just uh, is the man mm -hmm. not shoes uh, would be exactly the same without the word wearing? Oh, that's a good question. So um, we haven't tested on this specific case, but I would think uh, it will matter um, in the language modeling side. Uh, however. Um, this actually aligns well with what we want to argue that if you want to train the model, then it needs to be robust with these alterations that cost us you are proposing as well, right? Is, man, is the man not uh, wearing or is the man not with shoes? The model should be able to understand that and, and be robust to that as well. So this is an, uh, a, 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 a further extension that we want to do semantic augmentation on both the language and vision side. And then we can essentially generate data to train next round of models. And the next round of models will generate data as well. Um, I hope I have some time later to talk about it as well. Thank you. All right. Um, so yeah, so at this stage we we're thinking, okay, now, semantically re-engineering the uh, language data which gets a bit of success, but VQA LOL is still with the linguistic re-engineering. How about image re-engineering, right? Um, using a case here, if you see a human flying a green uh, frisbee, if the answer is what's the color of the, uh, the frisbee, the answer is green, uh, you may think, okay, the system seems to be with certain intelligence, but if I change the color and the system is still saying it's green, then there might be something we can further investigate as well. And this is exactly what we are observing from the state-of-the-art model. And this is the concept of um, uh, training on IID data and testing on OOD data is not new. Uh, all the way trace back to um, Davis and um, Parik groups um, VQA CP data set, essentially showing that if the model is trained on a IID data, then the language prior, such as the color of the banana, um, uh, almost all the color of the banana in the training data is yellow, thus the system typically tends to ignore the image data. To, uh, to essentially um, address this challenge, we propose a VQA mutant. And in the mutant model, we're trying to enable the mutations of inputs, not only just questions, but also with images. 
to expose the VQA model to semantically perceptually similar, but semantically dissimilar examples. And essentially, the intuitions we want to allow the model to understand the critical change in the input, which leads to a change in the answer as well. This is presented in ERVNLP 2020, and the actual modeling is an extension of LOL, where we are altering the image space by doing removal of objects, morphing of object colors, as well as um, augmenting from the question mutation, such as word masking, word substitution, and negation to create new pairs of data and um, utilize image processing techniques such as in painting, as well as um, color morphing, we are basically are able to create those new examples or training data from the original ones. Um, it is worth mentioning that, again, we are utilizing the benefit of pixel level annotations from MS Coco that makes the image editing much more reliable on this data set. So here are some examples of image mutation. And we also do language mutation of the data as showing certain example here as well. Now, again, at this stage, we are proposing guided semantic mutations to generate new pairs of data. However, we still need to introduce new constraints that regularize the model training. Here, we are utilizing First, the traditional VQA loss, which essentially a classification loss. And then we introduce an answer projection loss, which will project the output from the projection layer in the end-to-end um, -end, uh, um, network before and after mutation, as well as their respective answers, ground truth answers, onto a shared manifold. And once this shared space are being established, now we can introduce uh, uh, semantic constraints and we call it pairwise consistency loss. And this pairwise consistency loss is basically defined as this, the distance between predictions for mutant sample as well as the original sample must be consistent with the distance between true answers for mutant and original samples which essentially is saying that if I alter the input image and remove all the ships, then their semantic distance on the shared space between those two vectors should be maintained by their ground truth answers three back to zero, which are the ground truth answers embedded on the space. So with this semantic constraint, we can further regularize which is showing here for the regularize the model training, as well as deal with the OOD examples cause we are essentially augmenting the training data and uh, um, uh, ex exploring the space from the, um, the original uh, training space cause we are utilizing the tools of semantic parsing as well as image painting to explore the data space but not only exploring the data space, but adding on additional semantic constraints to regularize the model training, just like the classic vision of uh, um, task is trying to do. With that, uh, introducing the constraint and the new training data, we again observe um, performance uh, improvements, especially on the challenging VQA, changing, uh, changing prior data set, where the testing data uh, essentially in a totally different distribution. Um, and, and we are showing that using our model paired with LXMERT as the backbone models, um, getting the um, um, performance boost from the other methodologies uh, using um, testing on VQACP. And it's also worth mentioning that we are showing in our experiments that um, the image mutations and question mutations and any on both mutations helps the performance to improve step by step. Of course, these are still empirical evidences, but this em empirical evidences suggest that the augmentation is helping the model to explore a wider space and the guided training are essentially regularize this training of the models to maintain 
um, a, a, a high robustness with respect to the distributional change in the data set. Um, the last time I checked um, um, about two, uh, two months ago, our model mutant is still um, uh, holding the first place in the VQACP leaderboard. Um, but uh, to do the justice, um, um, uh, justice for other methodologies, they don't get access to the mutant data as we have. Um, so um, um, they are doing what they were asking to do, just they don't have the privilege to access the extended data. On the other side, uh, a sad note, we're also not adopting uh, external data. So it's a fair comparison we would like to argue. Uh, VQA LOL uh, is linguistic re-engineering. Then mutant is um, image and linguistic re-engineering. Re um, we are showing that um, the mutations it's not just data augmentation because we want to argue that the mutation essentially can inform the design of semantic constraints as well as regularizations that help us to leverage a pair of related inputs. Um, a few, uh, uh, we would like to acknowledge the recent work in image classification also shows carefully designed input manipulations can benefit generalization and robustness in VQA has been uh, uh, um, uh, um, um, an active topic, which with respect to the shift, distribution shift in answer space to sub questions, to entail questions, implied questions, and rephrased questions. And there's a new survey like um, paper on pre training of vision language pre trained models, um, summarizing all the robustness work as well. Um, I'll probably um, stop here to see if there's any questions. Okay, no, I'll continue. Now, we have um, started the journey as LOL, basically using logical connections. Then we utilize mutant using image um, uh, edit, um, editing to improve the data and improve the training of the VQA models. The next question we're asking ourselves is, there are also explicit knowledge that is being modeled as um, a, 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 a word net or phrase net or more recently atomic can we distill those explicit knowledge in an active way to model the, uh, and, and, and generate in, um, enriched outputs? And here we are taking video captioning as example. What a human understand and observed events also relate to what Costas was asking about actions. If we are taking in an action uh, video, and we will describe the, um, the, the video not only about the person is eating, which is the factual events, but also uh, start to infer about its cause. Maybe he is hungry, or he is seen as starving, or he can finish all the food on his plate as an uh, effect. So this semantic constraint we would like to introduce into the model and help us to generate a much rich and 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 and, and, and infer from what can be factually seen from the video domain. So in order to do that, we introduce video to common sense data. Here, um, we take in a video clip and augmenting from the factual description, such as a group of person dancing in a room, but I pair it with human understanding, such as what's the current event, which is the event, and why is the agent doing this, the cause, the effect, the attribute. And by utilizing um, uh, MSR VTT paired with Atomic, and we designed a cognitively uh, easy annotation um, and curation in interface, we be, will be able to generate the caption, which is the ground truth caption for the, for, for the video data, together with intention, effect, and attributes. And not only just for captioning or describing the videos, we can even further extend uh, um, this V2C challenge with QAs. And this QA challenge are essentially not just about what is actually happening in the video, but about what can be inferred as additional information from the videos, such as does the person want to protect his country? The answer will more likely to be yes. Or what's the intention of the person on the left is to defeat the enemy to protect the country. Um, um, here are some examples for the VQA uh, challenge 
uh, on the uh, video to common sense data and we formulate it into V2C compilation, V2C generation storytelling and V2C QA tasks in the original uh, uh, challenge setting. With that, we can show what we are basically evolving from using linguistic correlations tracing back to 2011 to generate actions by comparing the objects being detected and generate the most likely action, then get into a graph representation. And this graph representation can query external knowledge in around 2016 and 2017. And we are diving into uh, generating uh, inferred um, events or inferred concepts such as the cause, the effect, the attributes um, from the video coming in, the generation could be to know how to play soccer. A man is playing a soccer game and he will cautiously dribble the ball. The man is seen as issues, issues as uh, The data is online. And this is just one part of the data from um, our groups at ASU is um, 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 contributing to the com community. If you are interested, we're also generating recently uh, fairly interesting challenges as well. Here is the image readout challenge, which is taking in four images and you want the system to output single concept that connects all those four images. And this, the answer to this specific example is four. And then we are also dealing with VLQA challenge, which basically want to system to answer questions with respect to the image and the question inputs, but with the condition that you need to refer to both the question as well as the image to be able to confidently answer these questions. More recently, we are also moving towards into hypothetical actions. And here is the clever hypothetical data set um, pronounced the clever hype in a sense that we are coming up with hypothetical actions such as paint a small um, green ball with crayon, crayon color and then ans asking the system to ask a hypothetical question such as are there equal number of yellow cubes on left or purple objects and crane spheres from the original image. Um, all these data sets are publicly available online and for the um, uh, uh, audience who are interested, please um, uh, check them out. Uh, not only about um, semantic constraints into VQA, we also de dealt um, um, and developed systems and, tra and tracked with um, uh, texture grounding um, in, in 2019 and fine green level textual visual alignment for um, uh, pedestrian retrieval uh, in 2020 and more recently delve into self-supervised knowledge dist distillation where the semantic constraint can be also utilized to compress models. To summarize my talk, I would like to provide the following uh, view that I will hope um, to continue research along this line. Both LOL, mutant and V2C um, indicate us that um, if we carefully design semantic augmentation, we can essentially improve the model performance to make it more robust from the current stage. Now, what we are essentially making is there are original vision and language or any other multimodality data, you set correlations between them. And sometimes there is an output that you have correlations with them. Now, what we are essentially introducing is we can utilize computer vision techniques such as image in painting to augment the visual data. We can utilize NLP techniques such as semantic parsing to augment the language data. Then we can reestablish correlations between them. And we can even reestablish the output correlations between them as well. Here, F is a computer vision function, which is a kind of AI. G is an NLP function, which is another kind of AI. And we can essentially formulate new semantic constraints in the explored data space to further train model. Um, I think I'm running out of time, so I will just stop here. Um, I have um, uh, also prepared to talk about um, object search stuff in our research group, but I don't think I have time. Um, I'll stop here and see if there's any further questions. Um, well, let me quickly jump to the acknowledge page. 
Thank you very much, Yeju. Uh, uh, that's uh, very interesting. Um, I do you have any uh, 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 can you go back to the, the slide? I'm, I'm still a little missing how you do how you do the LOL mm -hmm. like uh, in terms of algorithm or what is really the challenge behind uh, implementing it. Um, maybe I'll just use the uh, mutant as an example, which yes. um, essentially um, we're not arguing that we are coming up with new models. And this is actually one of the critics from um, uh, Jeff Siskin as well. Um, we're not arguing we're coming up with new models. The, the, the backbone models, they are performing well uh, in learning the visual and language uh, related representations. However, they are not performing well to inject constraints, especially semantic constraints into the model training. I see. Mm -hmm. So what we are essentially doing is studying the um, uh, um, guided generation of the pairs of the data, which following human knowledge, right? If I color the Frisbee as pink, then the answer to this specific question should be altered to pink and this is a cognitive kind of capability human beings can do at very early age. Now, that pair of training data um, on one side gives us additional um, exposure to the training, to, to, the, to the actual supervision. But at the same time, they also have their internal relationships, right? And this internal relationship needs to be modeled in the uh, 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 regularization and, 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 and additional constraints to regularize and distill this um, relationship into the end-to-end -end model training. So, so that's basically what we are, we are, we are I doing. So I fully understand. I really appreciate uh, the use of constraints in losses. Uh, I mean, I understand it more when it is geometric constraints like the ones you mentioned at the beginning. So here, uh, you enforce the encodings of uh, these two pictures uh, uh, to lie close in the embedding space, or totally yes. I see. So uh, in with, the with, without any segmentation, just the global description of, of the picture. Correct. Correct. We are. So, I see. Um, so in principle, you have a loss term where uh, you reflect the constraints. Uh, uh, and how, how do you really do it during training? How do you group these pictures? Like how do you get these pairs? Uh, are they, do they have a label by hand that they have to lie close to each other or? That's a, that's a great question, um, Costas. Um, whenever we are doing data um, auto um, generation using machine learning tools, we will introduce noise into the training data. So, however, uh, the argument here is we don't need additional annotation because if I'm coloring the Frisbee to pink and then you know the answer to the exactly same question will be pink. You don't need human further annotation um, uh, to get that um, uh, curated data. And the same idea, I didn't got time to talk today, but maybe later I can discuss with you is in robotic space, you can adopt similar thing. For example, visual language navigation, right? If you have an understanding of the map that you know the kitchen is opposite of the living room, then essentially the instruction moving towards kitchen should be treated as well, the same as moving away from the living room. And, and, and this kind of trans, um, transformation and mapping essentially is not following the traditional um, training data, testing data, validation data, par machine learning paradigm. We're trying to break it. And we're trying to move in towards a post data set kind of setting 
that um, the the well, our group is only playing and meddling around with semantic constraints, semantic generations, actively creating the data, right? So um, you were mentioning the um, idea of active vision, which I <laughs> interact with Yanis over the last six years working with him. You have occlusion and you want to actively get new data that, uh, that the way you can do it, you can, you can, you can turn around and using your pen tilt um, to essentially actively get new data as a robot. Here, I would like to argue is we are trying to get new data as well, but the getting new data is not controlled by the agent, but controlled by the semantic reasoning process that we, 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 we basically um, extend the, the model. Um, a, a lot of work that and we are what currently do you, doing. What, what do you mean uh, there is no new model? Uh, because it is only in form of constraints what you are introducing, right? Um, it's not, um, I'm arguing there is no model. It's reviewing, <laughs> reviewers arguing is there is no mod, new model. Uh, but um, I would like to argue that we are essentially, since we are introducing new constraints, then the model is trained in a totally new paradigm. Right, so it's a uh, quote unquote new uh, novel in this space. Mm -hmm. and, <laughs> and, and there's all the extensions we can do. For example, um, self-supervised learning. Um, we are um, presenting ICLR 2021, adversarial learning, test time adaptation, causal reasoning, which from Damien um, in Australia also could be the ways to further even augment the data. However, there are always arguments that um, um, re-engineering or data re-engineering, um, of course, we are bringing new information by human uh, un understandable guidance, such as logics, such as mutation. Um, um, and the, 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 the high level, the overarching uh, quest is, how, how to distill that, how, how, to, how to utilize them, how to organically call, uh, inter integrate them into model training. That, that might be a one sentence challenge I'm, I'm, I'm trying to deal with. That's very interesting. Uh, uh, any other, uh, other, uh, other questions? Um, um, it, if, if I may, um, I would also like to mention that um, the, 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 the well kind of all the discussion I have with um, the people in the community, we are also vi uh, um, uh, seeing this kind of vicious cycles of vision language research, which you always have new exciting challenges such as captioning, VQA, mm -hmm. VLN, VCR coming out, but the flaws that being identified by the community is repeating, right? The language bias being identified in all of this data set uh, once and once over. Now, from a micro historical view, what are the ways that we can break <laughs> this cycle and really contributing to the community outside of that small village, um, and, and 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 through our efforts, we would like to argue maybe you know um, self-supervised uh, adversarial learning, uh, thinking about test time adaptation, and and all this um, uh, the potential ways. Um, um, we are moving even along the um, robotic object search space, which I don't have time to talk about today. Hopefully, you know, if I got an opportunity to talk for a next talk, um, but still the idea is to pose novel semantic constraints. Um, and, and once we introduce novel semantic constraints that can be distilled into the end-to-end -end model training. Um, yeah. Uh, 
so, I mean, uh, we have seen uh, several, uh, I mean, uh, in particular at, at uh, other groups, I mean, there is a lot of NLP people going into the visual question answering as well. Uh, and uh, uh, I'm wondering uh, uh, what can we use from the actual vision process here uh, or whether everything is really at the semantic level, uh, particularly in terms of actions, uh, what can we say about like qualitative reasoning about physics or uh, any of uh, uh, descri describing something in the mid level between uh, like concepts that are expressed uh, in la as language mm -hmm. and uh, really intermediate representation, you might have uh, a vision representation, so, something uh, uh, in between. Uh, uh, there's a level in between, which is really geometry and physics, uh, which uh, is uh, mapped to linguistics concepts. I mean, geometry, you can have uh, spatial relations, and in physics, you can have really actions. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, I'm wondering whether there is such a intermediate level there or you really just uh, uh, um, enforce uh, if there is any if any enforcement of constraints at this level at the physics or at the at the at the geometry level can affect the actual semantics because we do we do what you do but at the, at the at the lower level, like a geometry or uh, physics, right? I mean, oh, that's that's a great question and comment. Um, it is exactly the things that we are doing. Um, we are using recently. We found success in utilizing depths to help training VQA. You may think VQA is at that a high level models people, especially in LP people. They, they typically ignore the low level visual features and mid level visual understandings. But while we are moving into it and getting the success of image mutation, image editing, now we can introduce depth estimation. Now we can introduce single image monocular depth estimation and then utilizing the relationship in the training data and further even introduce like um, if A is in front of B, is A is in front of B, or if A moving on to B, so all these operations becomes possible, right? Now it's since we are introducing the training loss and, 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 and the semantic constraints into the into the end-to-end -end models, that supervision coming from depths. Then if depth works, then you can think about surface normal. You can think about um, uh, 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 material. Um, 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 or, or reflection, all these concepts, um, while well studied in the vision domain, now can be gradually introduced back into the VQA, image captioning, video captioning, um, all those high level cognitive tasks. And, and that is actually one of the, actually the major future avenues I would like to pursue. Um, with my research group. And we are already having one paper submitted to an anonymous conference. We cannot tell because following the, <laughs> the, 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 the guidelines, but the result is exciting. Just like you said, no one even think about depths will have such a good role in VQA, especially uh, understanding spatial relationship. It's such a such an intuitive idea, right? So, but no one is using it. Uh, that's something I hope um, in five or six months or so, I can openly talk about it um, with the audiences as well. Um, All right. Uh, so I will uh, uh, close the session here. Thank you very much for joining us. Yes, sir. thank you everybody for coming. Yeah, if I may just have one last sentence to the audience. Yes. 
since we are uh, all working from home, um, if you have any questions or interest in our work, feel free to shoot me an email or schedule Zoom meetings. I'm happy to talk further with Grass, Grass Lab fellows <laughs> as well. And I'm Thanks. also on Twitter um, if you would like to in interact. Thank you. Thank you, Costas. That's great. All right. Uh, uh, I will see you, Yezri, in a different uh, Zoom link. Okay. Okay. I'm drawing that right now. Okay. Thank you very much, everybody. See you later. Thank you.